What a great, great song, great reminder of the faithfulness of our loving God. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Right before the book of James, you'll come to Hebrews chapter 11. Towards the latter part of the New Testament, we're going to start a new series today called Faith in Action. And we're working on getting a banner made up and uh, really looking at, at uh, the title and the theme of it. You see the picture there? Uh, I went outside and I said, Bob, I need you to jump over a hurdle and I'm going to take your picture and then we're going to put it on the banner. And so, I, is that you, Bob? Maybe it's, it's Bob, see? And see him jumping over that hurdle? And you say, why in the world is he jumping over a hurdle? Because our faith, as James would talk to us about, remember we did a, a series on uh, faith out of James, and we entitled it Faith That Works. But our faith is always something to put into action. James would say, if you, if you have faith but you don't have any works, uh, how does anybody know you're born again? And then the writer, he was going to talk about the same thing. Our faith is to be put in actions. If I really have faith in God, it's going to be displayed in my life. And it's going to be a recognizable difference in my life. And so it is faith and it's in action. And over the next four months, we're going to be looking at each one of these biblical characters in Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to learn this truth, that overcoming hurdles in this life requires faith and action. And so that's the reason why he's jumping over the hurdle, because we're not just running a very easy race, but there are hurdles in our life uh, that we call this Christian race that we're going to have to overcome. And how are we going to overcome these hurdles? The same way they did all throughout Hebrews chapter 11 here, looking at all of these Old Testament biblical characters, some very, very familiar stories that we're going to be looking at uh, over the next little while. And so we're going to be learning about that, about how our faith in God will help us to overcome all of the obstacles, all of the hurdles, all the difficulties that we're going to face uh, in, this, in this life. Well, different people have different concepts of what faith is. Uh, Random House Dictionary defines faith as confidence or trusting in a person or a thing. A misguided schoolboy once said that faith is believing what you know ain't so. Uh, I don't think that's faith. I think that's deception right there. Uh, what does the writer of Hebrews say about faith? Verse 1, he says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now faith is mandatory for the Christian life. We become a Christian by faith, as Paul would tell us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that we are saved by grace through faith. So it is by the grace of God we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on Calvary that we become a born-again Christian. But then we also must live the Christian life by faith. As the writer Hebrews closed out chapter 10, verse 38, where he said, But the righteous ones shall live by faith. Or as John MacArthur put it, faith is the way to life, and faith is the way to live. We become a Christian by faith, and we live out the Christian life in our daily, daily lives by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is faith? Faith is believing in the existence of an invisible God. Faith makes the impossible possible. Faith trusts God to part the Red Sea when all you have is a rod. Faith trusts God to knock down the walls of Jericho with just a shout. Faith builds an ark before it is rain. Faith walks on the water when it's commanded to come. Parents, faith believes that God will save your kids. Church, faith believes that God will grow his church. Students, faith believes that God will get you through school. Faith asks no questions and faith makes no excuses. Fear says, what if? But faith says, even if. Faith truly is F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust him. With that in mind, let's dive into our first examination of this chapter. And I want to speak on this subject this morning. You've got to have faith. You've got to have faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. Let's stand together all over the building as we honor and reverence reading God's perfect word. You got your copy in front of you in whatever form you got it in, or they put it up on the screen for you. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 1, reading down to verse 3. Follow along as I read, because this now is God's inspired word. 
Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the words, worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that that which is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we are so grateful for all of the wonderful truths and the songs that we've sang today. We're thankful that you are here today. And Lord, we're asking that you would move in our lives, that you would take away all the distractions, both internal and external, and that our hearts and our minds would not wander, but we listen intently to what the Holy Spirit has to say to each and every one of us. And Lord, we ask you to examine our faith. Is it of a quality that you would be pleased with? And Father, we pray that you would help us to display greater faith in you in whatever area of our life you desire for us to do so. And Father, maybe that somebody does not know your Son as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, would even now be the hour that you would grant them by your grace and mercy salvation. And Father, for those that are burdened with heavy ladens on their heart, Lord, would you take those away and help us to surrender those to the foot of the cross. Lord, speak, and we will obey. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Well, three simple thoughts as we consider the importance of faith in our daily lives. Number one, I notice the proof of faith defined. The proof of faith defined. And so the writer of Hebrews, he defines for us what faith is, and it begins by showing us that we believe in the promises. We believe in the promises. He says there in verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Uh, this speaks of the future. You don't hope for something that you already have. He said it's not only the things that are hoped for, but it's the conviction of things not seen. Convic the assurance, uh, or King James used the word substance, it means a guarantee or a title deed. It speaks about a promise. It comes from a compound word, uh, hopo meaning under, and stasis meaning to stand. So combined together means to stand under. It refers to a foundation. Uh, biblical faith is not some shaky leap in the dark. It is a sure foundation. So people say, well, you have faith. They make it sound like we're just kind of having blind faith, just running out there and making foolish choices. But it really is a very sure foundation, our faith, in God's promises. Many people look to the future with fear and doubt, especially right now. They are very concerned. What's going to happen with COVID? What's going to happen with the election? What's going to happen with the economy? What's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? And they look to the future with great fear and anxiety and doubt and uncertainty. But the future is not uncertain, nor is the future left to chance. God is already there. So God lives in an eternal now. It is always right now for God. Yesterday was now for God. Today is now for God. Tomorrow is now for God. So God is already in the future, and he controls the future just as surely as he controls today. All of the events of the past and even the present are moving us headlong towards God's perfect and wonderful plan. Now, our faith in God is what helps us to look to the future with confidence rather than fear. Faith believes that the flowers will bloom again even when it is yet still winter. Faith believes that the sun will come up again even while it is still dark out. Faith believes on a deathbed that we go to a better place because we placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Faith believes that God will do exactly as he promised. Uh, we sing that song oftentimes, standing on the promises of God. And we can stand firm on these promises because God cannot and will not and does not lie. Oswald uh, Sanders said, Faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. That's a good word. The question is, what does God want you to trust him for today? It may be that God wants you to trust him for greater things in the area of your family. It may be that he wants you to trust him for greater things in the area of your finances. Maybe you're stressed out. 
and you're worried about how you're going to pay your bills or you're worried about job security or you're worried about the economy, what's going to happen? And God says, just trust me. The same God that took care of you yesterday is the same God that's going to take care of you tomorrow. It may be that you are worried and concerned in the area of your future. And God is saying, trust me with your future. I control your past. I control your present. And I can surely take care of you in your future. And so our hope is not found in the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, in Joe Biden, in Donald Trump. Our hope and trust is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a sure foundation in the midst of a shaky world. And so our future is presented in God's hands. Whatever is best, God is going to allow that to happen in our lives. And we must trust in an all-knowing God who loves us and cares deeply for us. Even as we just sung about a moment ago, even when I don't see you, you're still working. You never stop working. So God is always at work all around us, and we need to trust in what God is doing. Well, not only do we believe in the promises, but we also behold the proof. We behold the proof. Look what he says there in verse 11. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, but it's also the conviction of things not seen. The conviction of things not seen. The King James used the word evidence. It means proof. By faith we see the unseen. So it said it is the conviction or the evidence or the proof of things that we have yet to be able to see. The world says seeing is believing. If you want me to believe what you're saying, let me see it. Or well, they'll come to you and say, well, I can't believe in a God that I can't see, but if I could see him, if he could perform some kind of a miracle, then I would trust in him. Then I would believe if I can see it. But I only believe in what I can see with my eyes. But for the Christian, we understand that seeing, believing is seeing. And so we must believe, and then we will see. So Hebrews chapter 11, as we'll examine over the next four months, is the proof that God keeps his promises. In different ways, each one of the biblical characters outlined for us, which are Old Testament uh, biblical characters, they are there and they had to trust God for different things in their lives. And as they put their faith in God, they found that God keeps his word, that God is faithful, that God is reliable, even when we are not. And so Hebrews chapter 11 is proof that God keeps his promises. I'm telling you that God has proven his faithfulness to me over and over and over again. I remember when God called me into full-time ministry. I was over in, in uh, Israel. I was right there on the Sea of Galilee, right where God called Peter into the ministry in Luke chapter 5. And I sensed that the Holy Spirit was telling me, God, John, I want you in full-time ministry. So then when I came back and I was training dogs for a company at the time, and I began to talk a lot more about Jesus than I would about dog training. I began to tell the, the, my boss, I need all this time off because I want to go and get more involved in the church. And then I would go into Pastor Joe Douth and I would say to him, Pastor Joe, I believe that God's called me into the ministry. How will I know if I'm really called into ministry and if I should leave everything behind because I sense that God is telling me to quit my job and go off to Bible college. Now, nobody in my family had ever gone to college. I was the first one to ever go to college and graduate from it. I had been out of school for a long time. And I said, uh, studying is not really one of my high points. When I was in school, I was a slacker. I grew up in the 80s, you know, where they had a rock and roll style, looking like Billy Idol. And so I didn't really spend a whole lot of time getting good grades when I was in school. Chloe, don't listen to that. And then... When I got into the ministry and God finally convinced me, what I want you to do is quit your job and go and trust me and go into the ministry. And there I was saying, God, I wasn't exactly a millionaire, but I had a, a decent job making a halfway decent pay, and now you're telling me to go to no pay and go up there and figure this stuff out. I remember taking seven classes in my first semester when I was up there. And I had all these different classes because I didn't do so good on my tests for the English and the math and all that. I had to take all that over again, along with all of the theology degrees as well. And then I went to studying. And all the other uh, students there would say, hey, do you want to come and play football with us? I said, don't we got a test tomorrow? How do you have time to go play football? I've got to 
study because I got tests coming up. Uh, some of them were getting paid, their college paid by somebody else. I had to pay for my own college. And so they didn't give me free education when I went there. Now they're talking about free education. And so I would study. And I'd be in a shower thinking about the tests that were going to be in the morning. I, all day I was looking at the tests. And by the grace of God, I was able to graduate top of my class uh, with a very high uh, percentage. And, but God was there. And as I began to wonder, God, how am I going to get through this class? Now, if you ever been to college, you get that syllabus, and they said, what you're going to get is syllabus shock. And I looked at it, and I said, is this professor on drugs? How in the world am I going to be able to do all these book reports he wants me to do? How am I going to be able to do all these things he wants me to do? And does he understand that I have six other classes that I've got to do all the same stuff for? But I'm telling you, the grace of God got me through college, not only with the, the, the grades, but also taking the right classes at the right time, but also paying for the whole thing. And then they said to me, we have this program called Share the Pulpit. And what you can do is churches locally will open up their pulpits for students here and select students that are doing well in class, we feel like are serious about what they're doing here. We will allow those students to get involved in this program called Share the Pulpit. And you can go and you can preach in these various churches. Uh, the only sermon I had ever preached was one time before I left, when Larry Leonard and Joe Dowd got together and said, hey, we got to give this guy a license. We've got a license to preach so he'll be ready to go when he gets up there. And he's never preached. He's taught some Sunday school classes and spoken some men's conferences and whatnot, uh, men, men's uh, uh, day of the church. And then let's go ahead and let him preach one time. So that was the only sermon I ever preached. And the other guys would say, I'm going to wait until I take all these classes. It's not me. God called me to preach. I'm going to preach. And he'll Help me get through it. I'm telling you, God was faithful, Gene, and he got me through all of it. And I could tell you a thousand stories about the goodness of God and how he got me through. So faith is not something that I have to say, let me go and find somebody else to tell me a story about the faithfulness of God. I can go to my own life and look at how God over and over and over again has proven himself faithful to me in the midst of good times and bad times. So he says there in verse 1, he said, it's the conviction or the proof or the evidence of things not seen. What things is he talking about? Things refers to eternal life, heaven, and all of the other things that God has promised us in his word. So it's not some name it and claim it attitude where I'm going to go get a new Cadillac and I'm just going to say, God, you owe me a Cadillac. Uh, God never said, I'll give you a Cadillac. But he did say, if you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ, I'll save you. He did say, I'll take care of all of your needs according to my riches and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so all the things that he has promised, he is faithful to do exactly what he said he would do. And what an awesome God we serve. Well, we've seen the proof of faith defined, but let's take it a step further. What about the pleasure for faith declared? The pleasure for faith declared. Look at verse 2. He says, the men of old gained approval. Men of old. In this context, it refers to all the Old Testament saints outlined in chapter 11 that we'll look at over the next few months. And all of these different biblical characters and then the poor writer of Hebrews, like so many preachers today, he runs out of time, Gene, and he finally gets to the point where he just says, and what more shall I say? For time will fail me. In other words, I don't have enough time to tell you about all these other guys, so let me just throw them out there and y'all going to have to go home and read your Bibles later on and learn about their stories as well. The poor preacher never has enough time to preach. And so he just outlines over and over and over again all these different characters. And then he finally, as he's winding up the chapter, just starts throwing out people and you've got to kind of figure out who he's talking about. And then he just says, and then there was a bunch of others that we don't even know their names. And so God has worked in the lives of so many people. What he's saying is, I can illustrate it over and over and over again. How many illustrations do you want me to give you? And so it's men of old. All of these Old Testament biblical characters. He says they gained approval. Because of their faith, God was pleased with them, and he showed his approval of them. Now notice that word approval there in verse 2. It means a good testimony. They gained a good testimony. It's, it's the uh, Greek word martyrio, which is where we get the word martyr from. It's translated witness all throughout the New Testament. What God did was he looked them over 
And he saw how they displayed faith in him, and he was pleased with that. So he uses the word again in verse 4. He says, By faith Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, uh, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous God, testifying about his uh, gifts. And through faith, uh, though he is dead, yet he still speaks. Now he uses it again in verse 5, talking about Enoch. He said, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. He used it again in verse 39. And he says, And all these, all the ones that he couldn't talk about in the previous verses, gained approval through their faith. And they did not receive what was promised. And so he uses this word over and over again to say, here are some biblical examples of people who displayed faith in God. God was pleased by the way they displayed faith in him. And so therefore he bore witness to all of us about what they had done. Now faith is not just the best way to please God. Listen to me now. It is the only way for us to please God. Look what he said in verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Not is difficult. Not God is happy when we show faith. He says you cannot please God without faith. He says for he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he really exists, and that he is reward of those who seek him. And so it is impossible to please God if we do not have faith in our lives, and faith particularly in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we got to ask ourselves a question. How is my faith in God? In what areas does it need to be improved upon. Now, many people believe that God can. They say, oh yeah, I've read all those stories in the Bible. I've heard some folks tell me some good stories. Thank you for telling me that story about God's faithfulness while I went to college. And they believe that God can. But listen now, do we believe that God will? Amen. It's a big difference between saying, I believe that God can, but do I believe that God will? Unbelief not only displeases God, as you just read about in verse 6, but it shackles his omnipotent power. We talk about the omnipotence of God. We're saying that God is all-powerful. There's nothing that God can't do. He has all the resources at his disposal. He can do anything he desires to do, and yet a lack of faith will tie the hands of God. Let's see how this is played out. Go back with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. And guys, if we have it, you can throw it up on the screen, but you can go back in your Bible. Mark chapter 6. Look at verse 1. We're talking about how Jesus works in the context of faith. He's all-powerful, but he has chosen to work in the context of our faith. So look at Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. So Jesus has gone back home. Verse 2, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogues. And the many listeners were astonished. They were amazed that Jesus is teaching them. Now remember, these are the people that knew him, that grew up with him, that saw him, his neighbors, his family, his friends, his cousins. Uh, it says they were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. They said, how in the world did he get so smart? How is he able to perform these miracles? And then they try to downplay who he is there in verse 3. Is not this the carpenter? Isn't this the, the kid that grew up down the road? Isn't this the one that we went to school with? How is it that now he has such great wisdom that he is confounding the rabbis with the wisdom that he has about the things of God? And how can he perform these miracles? None of the rabbis around here are performing these miracles. we never seen the high priest perform these miracles. None of the Sanhedrin is doing these things. How is it that he is able to not only speak with such eloquence and wisdom about the things of God, but then on top of that he performs all these miracles and they're overwhelmed and and as they say down south, Bob, flabbergasted. And then it says, is he not the carpenter? Now watch this. The son of Mary. Now you know that the Bible always talks about somebody and points to the father. 
and they would say, the son of Joseph. Now some say maybe his father's no longer around, and that's why they're saying Mary. Uh, most scholars believe that it is a slander on him. In other words, there is a scandal. Who was his real father? Uh, his father could not possibly be Joseph. So who is his father? Maybe Mary was sleeping around. He is an illegitimate child, is what they're saying. So it's a scandal. It's a slander on his character. And so they're really downplaying who he is. The brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. Uh, by the way, I don't know how our Catholic buddies figure that one out when they say that Mary never had any kids after Jesus when the Bible says he had a whole bunch of siblings. And are not his sisters, so at least two, here with us. And they took offense at him. Wow, could you imagine taking offense at the Lord Jesus Christ? So what it says is Jesus offended them. Wow. Do you know that Jesus offends people today? Go and talk about at work tomorrow, Jesus Christ, and see what kind of conversation you engage in. Uh, now, everybody likes to say, God bless you, God bless America. Uh, just generic, doesn't mean nothing at all. It's cliche terminology. But say, the Lord Jesus Christ bless you. And see what kind of conversations you get in at work tomorrow. They like to talk about God in a generic sense. But as soon as you start talking about Jesus, he's very offensive to most. It says, and they took offense at him. Wow. Look at verse 4. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his own relatives in his own household. He said, if I'd have done these miracles anywhere else, they'd have been impressed and they'd have believed in me. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning, John, about how James, his half-brother, and we say half-brother because Jesus was born of a virgin. That's a good place to say amen right there. If he wasn't born of a virgin, you and I are still in our sins because he had sin in his life. But even his own brothers didn't know who he was. And it says, and he's not without honor. Anywhere else I'd have done these things, they'd have honored me. But here, you guys are so familiar with me that you do not honor me. Uh, by the way, can I ask you a question? Why does enchantment always happen somewhere else? Why do we believe that God might do a great work somewhere else, but not here? He's never done a great work here. He couldn't possibly do a great work here. But somewhere else, we expect that God's going to do a great work. You know why? Because we become familiar with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you become familiar with God, you start downplaying his power, and you hinder your faith in him. And we expect that God is not going to do anything significant. We just hope that we have a good service. We don't expect nobody's life to be changed. We read our Bibles. I'm just doing it because it's a thing to do. That's what Christians do. They read their Bibles in the morning. But we don't expect that the Holy Spirit's going to speak into our lives and give us any great revelation. Why? Because we become familiar with the Son of God in the house of God. Then he said in verse 5, and he could do no miracle there. Wait a minute now. God is omnipotent. He can do anything. But my Bible tells me that because of their unbelief and their doubt in the Son of God and their downplaying who he is, my Bible says he could do no miracle there. They tied the hands of God. Johnny Hunt has a great sermon on this text called Shackling Omnipotence. And then he says, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Wow. So there were some that had faith and God moved mightily in their lives. But the rest said, isn't this just the carpenter? Isn't this just Mary's son born into an illegitimate family? He certainly is not the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's just another preacher. And it says that he could only lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. It reminds me of the woman with the issue of blood. When Jesus is going through a tremendous crowd, and yet one person in the crowd experienced the almighty power of God. One woman. And he said, who has touched me? We've got to stop what we're doing. Well, wait a minute now, Jesus, we're in a hurry. We've got to go help Jairus' daughter. She can wait. God is moving here, and I'm going to join God in what he's already doing right here, and I need to know right now who touched me and find out what God's doing in her life. 
And out of that incredible crowd, only one person there experienced the power of God. It could be that God might speak today, but most of us will not hear a word that God has to say because we are not really expecting God to do anything today. We're just going through the motions, just showing up because it's Sunday, and that's what we do on Sunday. We go to church. But we're really not expecting God to do anything here today. But if we heard about doing something somewhere else, we'd be amazed. But not here at Seminole Springs. And it says, and he healed him. Now look at verse 6. Now, he wondered at their unbelief. They marveled at him. They took offense to him. Jesus said, I'll tell you what, what I marvel about is your unbelief. He says, that's what I'm amazed by. Is why you Jews don't expect the Son of the living God to do anything around here. Why his own family didn't expect him to do anything around here. And even times when they try to go to him and say, Jesus, you're going crazy. Come on out of here and stop talking to those folks in there. And no doubt they were embarrassed about it later on in life when they found out who he really was. And most scholars say James didn't get saved until after the resurrection. Then he figured out, wow, he really was somebody important. And it says, and he wondered at their unbelief. I'm telling you, unbelief shocks Almighty God. Now, only two times he uses this word. Once when they had unbelief, and once when a Gentile who shouldn't have believed did believe. And it says, and he was going around the villages teaching. Wow. So let me ask you this question. How is your lack of faith tying the hands of Almighty God? How is your lack of faith keeping you from experiencing the almighty power of Almighty God? It may be that we're praying for somebody to get saved, but we really don't believe that God is going to do it, and we're hindering God from working. We say, boy, we'd like to see this, this church grow. We want to see more people coming to the church. We're all the young families and all the kids and the youth, but we're not really believing God's going to do it, and we just assume he's going to send them all to real life, or he's going to send them all to journey or someplace else. And so we're not expecting God to do nothing here, and so therefore God says, I cannot work except in the context of your faith, and you have tied the hands of Almighty God. Wow. We say we know we ought to be doing these things, but we don't do it. I know that God can use anybody, anywhere, at any time, but we don't share our faith. I know that God is faithful and will help me pay my bills, but I can't afford a tithe. And if I do, I can't go beyond 10%. So I keep the training wheels on instead of giving sacrificially because I'm really not expecting that God is going to bless my finances. And so we just go through the motions week after week, month after month, and experience no power of God on our lives because we really don't believe that God's going to do anything significant. Not here, maybe over some other church. Well, we've seen the proof of faith defined. We've seen the pleasure of faith declared. But let's go back to Hebrews and notice the power of faith described. The power of faith described. So in verse 3, we notice that we believe in our Creator. We believe in our Creator. So we're told that faith is not some uh, shaky leap in the dark where we just hope that God's going to do something, but it's based on the Word of God, the promises of God, which are totally reliable. We see how God is pleased in the context of us displaying faith in Him. And He's not only displeased, but He's hindered from working in our lives if we don't have faith. But now we notice verse 3, His power and it is seen in our belief in our Creator. He says there in verse 3, by faith, and you're going to see this phrase in almost every verse, by faith, by faith. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God. That word, word, is the Greek word rima, and it means utterance or spoken word. So it's not written word, it's spoken word. God spoke and he made everything out of nothing. Uh, the Hebrew phrase in the Old Testament, John, is, is uh, ex nihilo, out of nothing. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. There was no light until God said, Let there be light. And then the darkness was dispelled by the light that God created. There was no earth until God said, let it be an earth. There was no water until he said, let it be water. No mountains until he said, let it be a mountain. So God spoke, 
and then it was there. That which was not there before was now there because of God speaking it into existence. Now, whether a person believes in creation or whether they believe in evolution, it is all done by faith, not science. Science, by its truest definition, is only that which can be proved, which is testable and observable. So you have to be able to test it, and you have to be able to observe it. Well, we weren't there at the beginning. We have the record of what the Bible says, but we believe that Moses, what he wrote down, because even he wasn't there, but we believe that God spoke in his life and said, hey, write this down, and he wrote it down. And so whether you believe in creation or whether you believe in evolution, it is all by faith. They want us to think that you guys believe by faith that God created everything, but science says it was through evolution, and that is a lie. Let me give you three non-religious reasons why evolution is impossible. Now, I can give you lots of biblical foundations for it, but let's say you're talking to somebody, they say, I don't believe the Bible, so therefore don't quote the Bible to me. It was written by a bunch of guys a long time ago, and so what are some other ways that you can convince them? Now, you students pay attention, because as you get up into the uh, other classes, higher and higher up in your education, they're going to lie to you, and they're going to tell you that it is all by evolution. And that there is no God, and especially in our liberal colleges today, where you have these professors with these fancy PhDs are going to say, your parents who don't really understand science, they were just trying to keep control over you, and so they told you this, some mythical guy up in the sky is going to punish you if you do bad, therefore you've got to listen to them. But it all come from evolution. So let me give you three reasons you can combat them. Number one. If the universe is eternal, which some of them say it is, we would never have gotten to this point in time. If you go back uh, to infinity, past, you will never get to a starting point. You just keep on going. So the universe cannot be eternal. It doesn't make any sense. Number two, Newton's laws of motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion stays in motion unless something outside of that object changes it. This pulpit will stay here for all eternity unless something outside of this pulpit moves it. Now, it could be like Brian. He comes over here and he moves it back and forth. It could be that the wind might knock it down. It could be that decay would destroy it and it would crumble and fall. But something outside this pulpit is going to move that pulpit or it'll be there a million years from now. Now, we know it won't last that long because it will eventually decay or Brian will come along and move it out of the way for Chad again. But an object at rest will stay at rest. We know that the universe is in motion. And so something outside of the universe had a kickstart the universe. Now, they will tell you that it was a, a big bang. All of a sudden, it was a bang. Well, then the question must be posed, what created the bang? What lit it up? Something outside of the universe had to begin the universe in motion. And it is moving exactly as it should be. Uh, we know that everything that is where it's supposed to be, that the earth, that's on 20, uh, the moon is on 23 and a half degree axis, goes around the earth. And if that moon is altered in any kind of way, it won't work. We know that the earth must go around the sun. If it doesn't go around the sun exactly where it is, it either gets sucked into the sun's gravitational pull and burn up, or it'll spin out and get too cold and we couldn't sustain life here. They're wasting money looking on Mars for life. There is no life out there. And they are wasting trillions of dollars because it is godless theory of evolution that says there are aliens out there somewhere, we've got to go find them. And they're not out there. Number three. So how is the universe in motion? Because God kickstarted. Because he is outside of the universe. But number three, the universe could not have created itself or else it would have existed before it existed. It doesn't make any logical sense. You don't need scripture to prove that it cannot be so. It is not even logical. It is not even scientific. There is no basis whatsoever for this godless theory of evolution. So how could the universe kickstart itself and how could it create itself? Matter had to be created from outside of the universe. You cannot create matter 
uh, without somebody outside the universe. Couldn't have created itself. So they want you to be convinced that somehow there was a bang billions of years ago and it just kick-started everything and over time it just all evolved into what we're looking at today. That the world just happened to land right where we are going around the sun just hot enough to sustain life, not too cold, not too hot. Ray Comfort uh, from the ministry Way of the Master, Living Waters is another name they use, uh, really helps out. In about two seconds, you can prove that there is a creator. How do we know that this building has a builder? It did not always exist. It didn't come together by itself. There was a builder who built this building. Uh, how do we know? We see a painting. The proof for the painting is the proof that there was a painter. It didn't just come together. Creation is the proof that there was a creator. It didn't just come by itself. So in the truest sense, there is no such thing as an atheist. An atheist says there is no God. A meaning no, and theist meaning God, no God. Uh, so in the truest sense, you'd have to say there is no such thing as a true atheist. At best, they could call themselves an agnostic. An agnostic says, I don't believe there's a God. But I don't know for a fact that there is no God. Because it's by faith that they believe that there's no God. And so we know by faith what the writer of Hebrews just said here. That those things which were not there are now there because God spoke them into existence and they exist now. So not only do we see the creator, but we also believe in his control. We believe in his control. Look at verse 3 again. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. They didn't come uh, out of some ridiculous theory. But they came because God spoke them into existence. And by the way, if you can't believe Genesis 1-1, you can't believe John 3-16. So if any portion of the Bible is wrong, it's all wrong. And he says, by faith we understand that the worlds uh, were prepared by the word of God. And that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. God spoke it in existence. There was no earth until he created the earth. There was no water until he created water. There was no light until he created light. Everything was not there. And it was created by God who is himself outside of the universe and eternal himself. Nobody created God. So if there was a creator, then there must be a controller. If God created the universe, then he must be controlling the universe. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, which we will probably join uh, when we get done with Hebrews. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, For by him, by Jesus, all things were created. All things. So Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that Jesus is a created being. How can it be a created being when the Bible says that all things were created? Both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible. Everything we can see, everything we can't see whether thrones or dominions or rulers of authorities, all things, and you don't have to be a Greek scholar to know what all means, all means everything, have been created through him, through Christ, and for him. And so if all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus, how could Jesus be created? He'd have been created through himself, for himself. Doesn't make any sense. Not even a logical statement. So God cannot be created because he created all things and all things means everything verse 17 he is before all things and in, all, in, in him all things hold together he controls the universe he makes sure that the earth is on a 23 and a half degree axis he makes sure that the earth stays exactly where it's supposed to be spinning around the sun he makes sure that the whole universe is going so we always hear about these these meteors that are coming around and the why, reason why they worry is because they don't believe their bible and so we don't have to worry about these meteors hitting the earth. They will one day, as we see about in the book of Revelation, but not these other ones that they're talking about. And so because they don't believe in their Bible, and by the way, they always want to talk about global warming. They keep changing their language around. It was global warming. They said, wait a minute, someplace ain't getting so warm. Then they said, well, it's climate change. I got news for them. They ought to read what Peter had to say about global warming. Peter said that the earth one day will be burned up. So it's going to get a lot hotter. And I'm not talking about a degree or two. I'm talking about completely burned up. And John said he looked around, he found out that God created a new heaven and a new earth. So it will be destroyed, but not in the way they think. 
The universe was not created by chance, and it will not be controlled by chance either. The sovereign God who made everything out of nothing is in full control over everything that happens. As I mentioned, our hope is not in Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It is not in the Democratic Party or the Republicans. It is not in the economy. It is not in any kind of fuel system. It is all in the Lord Jesus Christ. He controls everything that happens, and everything is rushing us headlong towards his perfect plan. By faith, you believe that God created you. I don't think there's a single person in this room that believes they came here because of pond scum, and they're really a, a relative of monkeys. So we all believe that God created us. Then why not believe that God is the best one to control our lives? We come to Christ by faith, we live for him by faith, and we even wait for him by faith. Now, we are anticipating the glorious return that they just sang about, that Christ is on his way back. God pleasing faith trusts God no matter what the circumstances may look like and no matter what the consequences may be. We're going to look over the next few months and see that circumstances look dim for some of these people. And the consequences were very severe. Uh, and some of them, it cost them their very life because of their faith in God and what they did. And we want to have faith in God as long as it benefits us in easy ways, but we don't really want to put our, our lives on the line for the kingdom of God. But the question we must ask is, how is your faith? And here's a question that I ask myself, and you can ask yourself. If I lived in Old Testament times, would the writer of Hebrews have included me in Hebrews chapter 11? Would my faith be such that God would say, I'm telling you, John, as I look down upon your faith, I am pleased with you, and I'm going to inspire the writer of Hebrews to put your name in there? Or would he say, well, John, you really have not displayed faith in me. Now, it's not about doing big things like building an ark uh, or something significant like that. We're going to look at some of the characters in there. Really didn't do a whole lot when you compare it to building an ark like that. And yet, some of them, we don't even have their names. But he says he knew who he was, and more importantly, God knew who they were. And so it's not about I got to be Billy Graham and I got to go all over the world and I got to preach crusades everywhere and lead millions of people to faith in Christ or God's not pleased with me. God can be pleased in the small things that we do. The question is, did I display faith in him and do what he asked me to do? Whether that was something the world might consider small, whether it's something the world might consider big. My job is not to try to compete with Noah and Billy Graham, and Paul, and everybody else, my job is to say, God, did I do what you asked me to do, and did I display faith in the ways that you told me to display faith? Amen. And so if I lived in the Old Testament, would God put me in there? If he said, you know what, I want to come up with a new hall of faith, would he put me in that hall of faith too? Or would he say, you really haven't done a whole lot at all? Because you really don't display much faith in me whatsoever. What does God want you to trust him for today? As we dive into the series over the next few months and look at how God worked in great ways and different kinds of ways and all these different characters, what does he want you to display faith in him for? Remember, you got to have faith. And so the question is, do you have faith in God? Have you ever started the journey of placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ be your personal Lord and Savior? Have you followed through with obedience in baptism like we saw last week? Uh, are you growing in your walk with God? Are you doing the things that please God? Remember what we talked about last week, and we saw it again this morning in Sunday school? A recognizable salvation. That somebody can say, I see a recognizable difference in your life. It's not about competing with Billy Graham and going off and being worldwide and being famous all over the world. It's about simply those that know us saying, I can see a recognizable difference in your life. And can our family and friends and those that know us best say, I'm telling you, to the best of my ability, I can see a difference in your life. I can see that you display faith in God, even in the little mundane, everyday things that you do. Or do we always feel like, well, God will use somebody else. Not me. He can't possibly use me. Can't possibly do a work in this church. He's going to have to do it somewhere else if he's going to get his work done. How does each individual need to 
increase in our faith? And how does Seminole Springs need to increase in our faith? Let's stand for prayer. The altar is going to be wide open. You know the areas that you trust God in. You know the areas that you don't. Maybe with a loved one. Maybe with your finances. Maybe your health. Maybe your future. Uh, whatever it may be. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we are so in love with you, Lord. We thank you for being so good to us. When we recognize that faith is how we began this journey, faith is how we must continue this journey, and our faith is going to see us until the other side. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us. Uh, do we have faith that pleases you? Is it based on the Word of God? Is it based on what the world has to say about faith? And so, Lord, I pray that you might help us. And Lord, as we were challenged this morning that faith is not only the only way to please you, but a lack of faith will hinder you from working in and through our lives. And so, God, I pray you'd help us to surrender ourselves to you fully and completely that you might have your way with us. And Lord, I pray you give us bold faith, biblical faith, faith that others will take notice, that they will see a recognizable difference in our lives. Father, move in our hearts here today that you might use us as we impact this world for the glory of God everywhere you take us tomorrow. Father, speak and we will obey. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God has spoken.